Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church on the third Sunday of Easter, where we keep on celebrating the truth of Christ's resurrection. It is good to care for your neighbor, and yes, to wear a mask when you're out in public. And I have been, and I suppose many of you have too, Pastor and I have. However, we are conducting this service pretty far from each other. We thought when we came out from the vestry, it would be wise for us to wear our masks so we'd be close to each other at that point. But I'm going to take it off for the rest of the service and probably at home as you're worshiping, you're worshiping without a mask. But uh, I would recommend that you use it out and, uh, in the public. It is good uh, care for your neighbor. You're protecting others. Welcome to worship today. Kids who are watching this with your families. A little bit later, we're going to have a children's sermon down at the font, and I have another Bible passage for you to be looking up ahead of time. So go get a Bible. Maybe you already learned that from a couple of weeks ago. Have a Bible with you, and then sometime, maybe during the next song, or another part leading up to the children's sermon, look up the book of Acts, the book of Acts, A-C-T-S, after the Gospel of John, and look for chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and then find verses 38 and 39. And I'll have you read a little bit of that in your family, uh, in your home there as you're worshiping. And I'll uh, read it also just to make sure we're on the same page. And we'll talk about all that this means, especially about God's promises. Are they promises by us or are they promises to or for us. We'll look at that a little bit later. So Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Welcome in the name of our Lord. We continue worship with How Good It Is from Psalm 133. Bye. 
Stand with me, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Christ has risen from the dead. Alleluia. God the Father has crowned him with glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. Alleluia. Alleluia. We take some time of silence for personal reflection and preparation for confession. Let us confess our sin to God, our merciful Father, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Creator and Preserver. We admit and confess our sinfulness. We are stained by sin from our very beginnings. We have sinned again and again in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves and have turned away from one another in our thinking, speaking, and doing. We have done the evil you forbid and have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for all our many sins. Have mercy on us, gracious Father. Forgive us all that is past and by the power of the Holy Spirit, direct our lives so that we serve you in true faithfulness. Grant us victory over all that oppresses us and build your kingdom among us here through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sisters and brothers in Christ, in his boundless mercy, God has promised forgiveness of sins to those who repent and turn to him for restoration and renewal. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God, keep you in his grace by the Holy Spirit and grant you a life on earth in which you tell of his greatness through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. the third Sunday of Easter. And the first reading is from Acts chapter 2, a part of Peter's Pentecost sermon. God's word does its work and bears fruit, as we see. Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him, Jesus, both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day, about 3,000 souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, kids, I don't know if you need to uh, come any closer to the TV or the computer is wherever you're watching this at home, but I do want you to kind of come closer in mind and in heart, and we'll have a children's sermon today here at the baptismal font. But before we talk about what's in there, and before we open up that Bible passage that I had you uh, look up, I want to ask you about 
Promises. Promises. Do you ever make promises? What kind of promises do you make? I mean, can you name some right now? I know I'm not going to be able to hear you, but maybe you could tell mom or dad or your brother or sister some of the promises that come to mind. Here's one that I think of that kids sometimes promise, and they should promise, and that is, um, I promise I will share. And that's hard, isn't it? You ever make that promise? I promise that I will share it. Something that I like, something that... Uh, somebody else likes, I promise I'll share. Can you take a moment to think about, are there some other promises that you make? Maybe you're thinking about that. Maybe you're telling people at home right now about some promises like, I promise I will make my bed. I promise I will do my homework. I promise I will help around the house. I promise. And not only kids make promises, but Adults, pastors, and parents make promises too. Promises that we're supposed to keep, right? Promises are made by us a lot, and we need to keep them. But were you listening to that Bible passage? I want you to open it up. Go to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and find verse 38. St. Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And while he was preaching God's word out of Peter's mouth, it showed people who Jesus is. It also showed them their sins and people, they wanted to do the right thing. But most of all, they wanted to be forgiven and be right with God. And so they asked, what should we do after we've heard God's word? Did you find Acts chapter 2 verse 38? I'm going to read verse 38, and then I'm going to ask you to read verse 39. If you're a reader, you read verse 39 out loud, and then afterward, I'll read it also to see if we got the right one. Verse 38 said, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now you take a moment, somebody in your family, read verse 38. 39, starting with the promise. Did you read it? It started and it went this way. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God will call. Did you notice something? That didn't say that we make a promise. It says God makes a promise. Some of you were probably baptized here at St. John's in this font. What's inside the baptismal font? That's right, water is in the font, right? And I put water in here, even though we don't have a baptism today. I wanted you to see that the same font where you were baptized, or maybe you were baptized in another church, it has water in it. And then God's word, when the pastor says, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, God's word makes a promise to us that we now belong to him because we're baptized in his name. Baptism is not about our promise to God. It is his promise to us. Or you could say it's not a promise by us, but a promise for us. In fact, I'd like you to repeat after me. If you're following along, I'd like you to actually say these words after I say them. Baptism is about... Oh, uh, people in, a few people are here, and Pastor is saying it. That's good. Let's do it again, Pastor, because that's the way to do it. I was just kind of going to imagine it in my mind. Baptism is about, Baptism is about God's, promise for us, God's promise for us, not our promise by us, not our promise by us. You see, in baptism, God makes the promises. So we can baptize even babies like 
This week, this week happens to be the week of my baptismal birthday. 58 years ago, my mom and dad carried me like a little baby, just about a month old, to the baptismal font at Christ Lutheran Church in Peoria, and I was baptized, thank God, in a font a lot like this. And it wasn't about my promise to God. It was about God's promise to me. Same thing with you. Baptism is not about our promise. It is about God's promise to us. Let's read that Bible passage one more time. I'll read it with you. Just verse 39. Maybe we have the same Bible translation. I'm reading from the New International Bible, the same Bible that's in our pews. That verse went this way. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Thank God that the promise of baptism and God's word, forgiveness and grace and life, these are God's promises to us. Keep your promises, but most of all, rejoice that God has kept his promises to you. He loves you. Let's go back to worship. I'll, put the, I'll leave the, open, the font open. That way, Pastor will remember to empty the water afterward. If I cover it up, maybe it will stay um, covered up for a long time. So we'll leave that off, and you can kind of um, help me remember. Let's go back to listening to God's Word. The epistle lesson today is from the same man, the same disciple, apostle, saint, Peter, who preached that Pentecost sermon. His first epistle, chapter 1. If you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake, who, through him, are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God." Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly with a sincere heart, since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls But the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The song, 10,000 Reasons, which is from Psalm 103.
For the reading of the Holy Gospel, stand with me, please. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. That very day, two disciples were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he went to them. He said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And Jesus said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged Jesus to strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, 
And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated to sing, Christ is our hope in life and in death. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from our risen Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may his spirit open up our hearts and minds to his word. Amen. Amen. Our text for this evening is found in Luke chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Today, many people are very frustrated, angry, upset, feeling hopeless because of this coronavirus. We want to cure and we want to get back to things that are just normal. 
And we need someone or something to bring about an end to this virus. And though this virus is a pandemic, it will cease to be one day. But you know, there's another pandemic that is far worse than this virus. It is a pandemic that destroys marriages and homes. It is a pandemic that destroys people's lives and their relationships with other people. It is a pandemic that causes us grief and pain. And it brings death and death is going to come. And there's no way that we can stop it. As people who live on this earth, there is no scientific way that we can bring an end to this pandemic. And it brings not only death, but eternal pain. And this pandemic is called sin. But that does not leave us without hope. For there is a cure for that sin. There is one who can bring us life and a health that yet maybe we will die and we will, but we'll live again and we'll be perfect in every way. This one who can cure this pandemic of sin came to give us life, not only for right now, but forever and eternity. Our text surrounds a man by the name of Zacchaeus. You know, and children have sang that song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree, his savior for to see. Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He was a scum of society as far as the Israelite people were concerned. He was a betrayer, for he helped the Romans and he overtaxed people to fill his own pockets. And when Jesus asked him to come down, he says, I'm going to go to your home today. And when Jesus went to his home, Zacchaeus' life changed. It changed because he repented of his sin. He said, behold, Lord, the half of goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore fourfold. And listen to what Jesus said to him. Today, salvation has come to this house. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You know, Jesus sought out people. He came for everybody, but he sought out specific people, you might say in life, to be examples of who he is willing to save. And I tell you, as you look at those examples, He's willing to save anybody, no matter who they are or what they have done. All the hate and the bitterness, the self-seeking, lustful desires, and every kind of sickness, yes, even the coronavirus, is a result of sin being in the world, the brokenness. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they brought sin upon themselves and upon all mankind, along with everything else that comes with it. Terrible afflictions and sins. And Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, who uh, did not want any of us to die eternally. He wanted us to be his. He loved us. We were his creation. And Jesus in accord with his Father's will, was willing to come into our life to become one of us, to be born of the Virgin Mary, so that he might seek and save that which was lost. And that's everyone. And after Jesus was 30 years old and he went to be baptized, he began his ministry. The next day, John seeing Jesus said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, or in other words, he was saying, Behold the one who 
seeks to save the lost. He's come here for everyone. As we study the Bible, we find examples of who Jesus sought out in life. And he wants us to know that if he loves these people, he loves all of us, no matter who we are or what we have done. And there are many examples of those he came to seek and to save. And I think when he traveled and went places, he always had someone in mind, knew ahead of time who he was seeking out. We think of the Samaritan woman. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. And when Jesus asked her for a drink of water, he was telling her, I accept you. I love you. You're an important person to me. And I have something I want to give you. And as they talked, they got to the point where Jesus confronted her with her sins. He says, go get your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And he says, you've been married five times. And the boy, the guy's living with you now, he's a living boyfriend. That's not good news. She had a bad reputation, surely, in the city. And she came out to get things to drink when nobody else was around. She, she didn't have to deal with their remarks. But when Jesus offered her the water of life and she believed, she went back into the city to the very people who had belittled her and that and told them, she confessed to them everything she had done. He says, and I want you to meet him. I want you to come to see this guy who seeks and saves the lost. He came to save her and she started a new life. And then there was a woman who was taken in adultery she was drugged before Jesus. She could have been stoned according to the law. And Jesus didn't, uh, was the only one who could have stoned her because he said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And they all walked away. And this one who came to seek and save the lost says, neither do I condemn you. Don't go do it anymore. She had a new life, a new beginning because of Jesus. And then you think of Mary Magdalene. The Bible tells us she had seven demons. Wow, that must have been a terrible person, the things that she did. But Jesus sought her out and he cast those demons out because he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then you think of the man uh, who lived among the tombs. It says he, uh, he was demon possessed. It said he had an unclean he had an unclean spirits so he lived among the tombs and Jesus cast out those unclean spirits and this man's life changed because when Jesus comes into a person's life you become different you change and you know Jesus just loves us and you think about his own disciples when down, uh, Thomas was told about that they had seen Jesus what did Thomas say I'm not going to believe you until I touch those wounds and I see him. And Jesus, when he came to him, didn't chew him out. But he showed himself to Jesus, Thomas because he'd come to seek and to save lost. He came to rescue him. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus said those wonderful words. You believe because you see me, but blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. And as we heard last week in the epistle reading, Peter, as he wrote to these Christians who are being persecuted, who are going through rough times in their lives, he said, you love him, though you've never seen him. You believe in him. Because Jesus had come to seek and to save that which was lost. And then we think about the two men, as we heard in the gospel reading, walking on the road to Emmaus. All of the disciples, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, thought it was the end. There was no more. And if Jesus had not appeared to them, they would have thought it was over and they would have turned away from following him and went back to the old way of life. But Jesus appeared to them alive because he had come to seek and to save that which was lost. He wanted them to know that he was there for them, that he came for them. 
And one of the greatest examples of him seeking to save the lost was when he rode into Jerusalem as the king of kings and received a crown of thorn and was nailed to a cross as a common criminal, as a scum of the earth. But he let that all happen. He said nothing. He remained silent. In essence, as he was falsely accused and condemned. Because he was guilty in this way. He was taking all of our sins upon himself. No matter who we are or what we have done in life. No matter how mean or terrible. If you were a terrorist and you did very evil things. Jesus loves that person, not what they do, but he came to seek and to save the lost. And he was nailed to that tree to pay our debt, to suffer our hell, because he'd come to seek and to save the lost. And when he rose from the grave, he has showed himself alive to the disciples, to the women, to 500 people at one time. Why did he do that? Because if he had just disappeared, they would have thought it was over. But he appeared to them because he wanted them to know that he was alive, that he had accomplished that which he had come to do, as he explained to the two men on the road to Emmaus. He went back to the scripture and said, it's all talking about me, folks. I'm the fulfillment of what God had promised. And I did what was necessary to save all people. For I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And you know, Jesus just didn't stop right there. Before he ascended into heaven, after he showed himself alive and they become convinced, he said to his disciples and to his followers, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. And I want you to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Peach repentance and forgiveness of sins, and you will be my witnesses. Go speak my word, the gospel. I've come to seek and to save the lost, and I'm not giving up on that. I'm going to do it through you. As you share the message of the cross with people, you don't change people. I don't change people. Jesus changes people. His word changes people. The gospel is powerful. We need the law to show us our, that we're sick. You know, there's some people with this coronavirus, don't think, eh, nothing to it. Well, if they get it, they're going to know something's to it. As that young lady did that wrote the article in the Effingham News. And who took care of patients like that. And she got the virus. And says how terrible it is. Sometimes we think we're well when we're truly sick. That's what the Pharisees thought. But Jesus comes to help us understand we're sick. And he's the cure. For he had come to seek and to save the lost. And he wants us to share the gospel because it changes lives. St. Paul said it this way. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Dear God, we sure need your help. I don't know about you, but I don't share the gospel as I ought there's many people who need to hear. We want to see the world change. We want a better world. And God lets some of these terrible things happen because he wants us to turn to him and see his deliverance. And it isn't just being made well physically. It's being made well spiritually. And having our relationship restored with him. And when we walk with God... We're going to have a joyful life, even in the midst of persecution and hardships. Because we know Jesus is our Savior. 
And this life is temporary. But we have one that is eternal that awaits us. But as we live this daily life, may we pray. Jesus, we ask you, please seek and save the lost through us. As we seek to bring the message of the cross to others, that they may be cured of a sin sickness, a pandemic, that we can do nothing about. But you can, and you can give us life forever. For you came to seek and to save the lost. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I would ask that you would open up your worship folder to page uh, 6, as uh, in the past we've been uh, going through the catechism. And last week we went through the first article, I Believe in God the Father Almighty. And to this evening, uh, evening day we're going to go through the second article. What is the second article of the Apostles' Creed? Join with me. I, I believe in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, His only Son, Son our Lord, Lord who Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, Son suffered Lord, under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. Who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won from me all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead lives and reigns to all eternity, this is most certainly true. We stand together for the prayer of the church, for ourselves and for all people according to their needs. Let us pray. You have cleansed us, O Lord, with water and the word in baptism. Promises you made and promises you keep. You've marked us as your own people. Give to us grace that we may live out this faith in holy lives, lifting up your name in word and in thanks for all that you have done. Give us and guide us that with souls purified by obedience to the truth, we may love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. Guard us, we pray, O Lord, and all authorities in our lives, from parents to presidents. Guard and keep, we pray, our temporal authorities, including our nation, that we may enjoy peace and security in the face of threat and danger. Bless, we pray, Donald, our president, and the Congress of the United States. Bless, we pray, JB, our governor, and all state and local officials that they may fulfill their offices faithfully. Bless all emergency and medical workers and all of the members of our armed forces and their families who protect and sacrifice. And we pray that you would teach the nations the ways of peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Deliver us from all of our afflictions in your time and way and grant us strength to bear all burdens Hear us in particular as we pray for Bill Draper and Dick Hulscutter, Connie Phelps and Janet Martins, for Austin Miller, for Mary Wolfmeyer and Kathy Coates, for the Urbanic family, for Zach Fritcher and Gerald Pontius, for Lori Mayberry and Janet Brinkoff, Julie Scott and Jan Pike, Rochelle Allwart and Pastor Ted Gall, for Colin Kinkler, 
and for all these whom we name in silence. According to your gracious will, heal the sick, relieve those who suffer, comfort the grieving, and give peace to the dying. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O Lord, for our nearest neighbors, that we would reach out to them with love and sacrifice and the good news of Jesus Christ, who came to seek and to save. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our confirmands of our congregation as they are preparing to stand and make the good confession. We pray for McKenna, Andrew, Evan, Katie, Kylie, Camille, Elena, AJ, Sophia, Aiden, and for their parents. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all of our seminary students, including the seminary student we have supported this year, Mr. Mike Stein, who are receiving their calls into the pastoral office this week, strengthen, bless, and use them according to your will and time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Accept, O Lord, this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving that we bring to you for all of your goodness and generosity. And with our song of praise, accept our tithes and our offerings, that your church may have the resources to proclaim your gospel and care for the people in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you would have us pray, we combine in the prayer that our Lord has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. My Savior lives.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the peace of knowing that, go forth confidently and with Easter courage. God's peace.